Because he is not the sinless Messiah himself, the high priest first offers a sacrifice, a bull, to atone for his own sins and for those of his family. Then two goats are chosen. One of them is to be selected by lot to bear the sins of the people through his sacrificial death. He is slain to cover the sins of his people, for one year anyway. That goat dies so the other one might live. The second goat is set free, but it's not allowed to run around loose in the camp or the temple environs. The scapegoat is released into the wilderness, where it would surely die without Yahweh's provision. This same principle was acted out again at Yahshua's crucifixion. There, Barabbas, a man who clearly deserved his punishment, just like you and me, was set free while the Messiah was executed, quite literally, in his place. But was Barabbas free, really? His ultimate freedom depended wholly upon what he did with the one who had died in his place. For until and unless his sins were covered by the blood of Yahweh's sacrifice, Barabbas would remain a dead man walking. Thus, on the Day of Atonement, the priest was to confess over the scapegoat all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions concerning their sins, putting them on the head of the goat. The goat shall bear on itself all the iniquities to an uninhabited land. Likewise, we have been set free because Yahweh chose to accept the sacrifice of Yahshua in our place, but we still bear our own sins until we choose to avail ourselves of God's provision for us. In the goat's case, it's the food and water Yahweh provided for him in the wilderness. In our case, it's the atoning sacrifice of the blood of Christ. Is this ringing any bells? It should. It's the exact picture of Israel being sent into the wilderness under God's protection in the last days. They are an echo of the scapegoat, still bearing the sins of Israel on their head. What they do with God's provision there in the wilderness will make all the difference between life and death. Then the high priest shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from the altar before Yahweh, with his hands full of sweet incense beaten fine, and bring it inside the veil. And he shall put the incense on the fire before Yahweh, that the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that is on the testimony, lest he die. Then he shall take some of the blood of the bull, and sprinkle it with his fingers on the mercy seat on the east side. And before the mercy seat he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. The incense represents our prayers, through which we may now enter into the very presence of Yahweh, via the agency of our final high priest, Yahshua. Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering, which is for the people, bring its blood inside the veil, do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bull, and sprinkle it on the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. So he shall make atonement for the set-apart place, because of the uncleanliness of the children of Israel, and because of their transgressions, for all their sins. And so he shall do for the tabernacle of meeting, which remains among them in the midst of their uncleanliness." No atonement could be made for sins unless the blood of a suitable sacrifice was shed. This prescribed sacrifice would cover the people's sins for one year. Furthermore, that blood had to be applied to the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant if it were to be efficacious. And it bears repeating, that fact continues to pose a tremendous problem for the Jews. The mercy seat has not been available for its proper annual service since Jerusalem fell to the Babylonians in 586 B.C. But as we discovered in chapter 13, Yahweh saw to it that the blood of his perfect sacrifice, the Messiah, was sprinkled upon the mercy seat as Yahshua bled and died at Calvary. That facet of the Day of Atonement has therefore been fulfilled, but it did not occur on the tenth day of Tishrei in the autumn. Yahweh has something else, something wonderful planned for that day. 
Moses goes on to describe in great detail how the ritual atonement is to be performed, and he ends by summarizing the when, where, why, and how of it. This shall be a statute forever for you. In the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict your souls, and do no work at all, whether as a native of your own country or a stranger who dwells among you. For on that day the priest shall make atonement for you, to cleanse you, that you may be clean from all of your sins before Yahweh. It is a Sabbath of solemn rest to you, and you shall afflict your souls. It is a statute forever, and the priest who is anointed and consecrated to minister as priest in his father's place shall make atonement and put on the linen clothes, the set-apart garments. Then he shall make atonement for the set-apart sanctuary, and he shall make atonement for the tabernacle of meeting and for the altar, and he shall make atonement for the priests, and for all the people of the assembly. This shall be an everlasting statute to you, to make atonement for the children of Israel, for all their sins once a year. Leviticus 16, 12-16, 21-22, 29-34 Whenever the text refers to the priest, think of the ultimate high priest, Yahshua our Messiah. And note that just as Aaron's descendants were to perform these solemn rehearsals in his place throughout their generations, so Yahshua would be our perpetual high priest. Anointed and consecrated to minister as priest in his father's place. This last section refers twice to the Sabbath aspects of the Day of Atonement, and twice it commands, You shall afflict your souls, an emphasis that was repeated in the Leviticus 23 passage above. As we begin to explore other scriptures that help illuminate the Day of Atonement, please keep in mind Israel's plight during the Great Tribulation, utter helplessness to effect their national salvation and agony over the seeming dichotomy between Yahweh's recent miraculous victory over their Muslim tormentors and their present precarious predicament. Doing no work at all is an essential concept in the doctrine of salvation, one that is particularly hard for most Jews to grasp. But during these last days, a Sabbath rest will be imposed upon on them. They will be forced to sit back and watch Yahweh achieve their final salvation without their help. <gasps> this, as we shall see, will inexorably lead to a profound national repentance, an affliction of Israel's collective soul, the final step in their journey toward the light, the recognition and acceptance of Yahshua, their Messiah. <laughs> The fact that the Day of Atonement, as presented in the Torah, is impossible to keep and has been for over 2,500 years ought to have sent hordes of Jews back to their scriptures to try to figure out what happened. The prophet Jeremiah, writing at the very time when the Ark of the Covenant went missing from the temple, tells them where they went wrong. Behold, the days are coming, says Yahweh, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says Yahweh. But this is the covenant which I shall make with the house of Israel after those days, says Yahweh. I will put my law in their minds, and write it on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, No, Yahweh, for they all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says Yahweh. For I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more. Jeremiah 31 31 through 34. Israel, the remnant who hasn't given up, is still trying to operate under the old covenant, the law. 
But their own scriptures plainly state that a new covenant is in effect, one in which the law of Yahweh is not an outward regimen of rule-keeping, but an inward relationship with their God. In reality, it's a renewal of the original covenant. The rules were never the point. Nothing has changed. By the way, those who are still laboring under the illusion that the church has somehow taken the place of Israel in the heart of Yahweh need to read this passage carefully. The renewed covenant is not between God and the believing Gentiles. It is between Yahweh and Israel. Israel, or more precisely, the house of Israel and the house of Judah, all twelve tribes. Gentile Christians are only incidentally beneficiaries of the renewed covenant. We are but wild branches that have been grafted into the olive tree of God's kingdom, orphan children who have been adopted into Yahweh's family, prodigal sons who were dead but were given new life. In the context of our discussion of the Day of Atonement, note that all seven of Yahweh's mikra are to be fulfilled in the precise order in which they were mandated in the Torah. As the Feast of Weeks introduced the church, the Feast of Trumpets will herald its exit. And as the Feast of Trumpets precedes the Day of Atonement, so must the rapture of Yahshua's called-out assembly precede the renewed covenant with the house of Yisrael and with the house of Judah, when Yahweh will forgive their iniquity and remember their sins no more. Ezekiel says more or less the same thing, stressing that the choice of whether Israel follows Yahweh or not carries consequences with it. Thus says Yahweh our God, I will gather you from the people, assemble you from the countries where you have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel, and they will go there, and they will take away all its detestable things, and all its abominations from there. Then I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within them, and take the stony heart out of their flesh, and give them a heart of flesh, that they may walk in my statutes, and keep my judgments, and do them. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God. But as for those whose hearts follow the desire of their detestable things, and their abominations, I will recompense their deeds upon their own heads, says Yahweh. Ezekiel 11:17 through 21 The Jews, in trying to rigidly adhere to the law, had developed a heart, not to mention a head, of stone by following the letter of the law to the exclusion of its spirit, a spirit of love, mercy, and gratitude. Understand, of course, that nobody actually kept the instructions of Yahweh. What the Jews did was try to observe a mere caricature of what Yahweh had actually said to do. He said, for example, don't do your regular work on the Sabbath. They said things like, if you walk farther than 2,000 cubits on the Sabbath, you've broken the law. Their law, maybe, not Yahweh's. Here in Ezekiel, Yahweh says that they'll never be able to walk in my statutes and keep my judgments until they've had a change of heart. David foresaw a day when his people's heart of stone would be traded in for something a bit softer. Yahweh is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards those who revere him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Notice that it's Yahweh doing the pulling, not Israel doing the pushing. As a father pities his children, so Yahweh pities those who revere him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass, as a flower of the field. So he flourishes. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and the place remembers it no more. 
David knew what it was like to disappoint his Creator, but as a father himself, he understood God's perspective on his children. We are all going to screw up now and then. And although the wages of our sin is death, Yahweh wants nothing more than to restore fellowship with his kids as early and as often as possible. But the mercy of Yahweh is from everlasting to everlasting on those who revere him and his righteousness to the children's children, to such that keep his covenant, and to those who remember his commandments to do them. Psalm 103, 8-18.